Well, good afternoon, everyone. Once again, Cynthia Tomain here with Interactive Brokers, and thank you for joining us as we take a look at how you can sharpen your instincts with uh, in trading E-mini stock index futures. Now, with us today, I am most pleased to have Tim Morge. Tim is one of our favorite presenters and always a huge draw. So, Tim, <clears throat> um, thank you for joining us today, and thank you for taking your time to go over uh, information that's important to all of today's audience. So, Tim, I'm going to actually pass you the ball, uh, <clears throat> and it, I see you've unmuted. So, if you can go ahead, let's get underway. Cynthia, can you hear me? Let's start over uh, Ah, yes, I can, Tim. And now, do I sound better? I think That's I was on better. my speakerphone a moment ago. So There you go. There, now I'm better. Okay, it everyone. Like real Cynthia. <laughs> well, Tim, welcome, and thank you. Let's get started. Okay, thank you all for taking time to come. Thank you, Cynthia, for inviting me. Uh, the CME is very busy this morning, so Cynthia is standing in for both Mark and Barbara Schmidt bailey but uh, that's fine. We're all good. We know each other, and we'll get going. Um, you don't need to see my picture anymore. Um, I'm founder and president of Market Geometry. That's where we try and teach traders to be uh, more consistently profitable. Um, I'm going to do a little slightly different. Anytime we get together, we have to do a risk disclaimer. Um, and, of course, Cynthia's already done one for interactive brokers. Um, I'm going to do literally a one-line risk disclaimer. There's no holy grail. I don't have it. But I'm going to add one thing that I have not added before, which is uh, some of you that know me or have been to some of these seminars in the past or have are members at Market Geometry know that I'm one of the ten largest traders in the world. Um, I'm known as one of the whales in most of the markets I trade. And I, I recently had a uh, conference phone call. I've been teaching... Uh, our premium members and some people here at IB, and we, and we promise to come back and teach more about whale tracks. We're going to talk about those today. Uh, and one of the phone calls I got was, why would you teach people this information? I mean, you're kind of giving up the brotherhood. And I have a simple explanation to all of you. First of all, I don't, I don't care what other people think. I'm, I'm past that. I've been trading for more than 40 years. The people that taught me, Dr. Andrews, uh, Amos Hostetter, some other people, have been, were very generous with me. Uh, when I was a very young, I don't want to say boy, but young adult, how's that? And so I've been around a very, very long time, longer than these other people. And when I was very young, frankly, we were, we were a very poor family. We had eight children. My father was a welder, and he worked two jobs. He worked a factory job at Austin Western, which is a a grading, greater company that's no longer around. And then he also had his own welding service, and he'd come home and weld until about midnight and then go to bed and then come up and wake up and go to work. But every Saturday morning, come rain or shine or snow, he would go to the local high school and freely teach anyone that showed up in the technical school how to weld. And somewhere around the mid-1990s, Amos passed away in the late 70s in an unfortunate car accident. Dr. Andrews passed away uh, after 10 years of dementia in 1987. His methods were being lost to the world. Amos's methods are lost to the world. I'm the only link back to them. Somewhere along the way, I hadn't had a family yet, but I had a feeling that it was time for me to start giving back. And so that's what I try and do. And if people don't like it, I don't really care. Um, I'm going to try. There are so many traders in the world, I can reach so few. And we actually have several other people here today that studied with me at Dr. Andrews' house when we were part of the Coral Gables group, with this, which was his original circle. So it's a pleasure to see all of you, by the way. Um, I'm just going to try and help you all. Because most people trade, they may or may not make money, but they really have absolutely no idea what moves the market. And I'm going to try and give you a clue, at least from my perspective, 
what moves the market, and how helpful it can be if you can read the language of market of the market, and then uh, trade with the whales. You don't have to be a whale to trade with us. So with that, let's get started. This is my experience. Your experience may differ. You may or may not be able to do this, but just having the knowledge may be a great deal of help. So none of you are poor seals. Wait, don't feel that way. And one last thing, Vladimir, happy birthday. So again, this webcast is dedicated to my, this whole year I'm dedicating my webcast, all, all of my sessions, to Dr. Alan Andrews. He was a great market researcher. He applied Newtonian physics in the 1920s to develop the median line, which is the really the only true leading indicator available to traders. And of course, Amos Hostetter, he was a master of risk reward and money management, and in my opinion, the best campaign campaign trader or portfolio trader in the last 300 years. I studied, I have studied many traders back at least 300 years. No one is better than Amos in terms of long-term trading, and it's because of his money management and risk reward. He's really the the founder of that, uh, the modern founder of risk reward, um, and it, it it really has revolutionized trading for those of us that were exposed to his methods. And unfortunately, as I said, he passed away in the late 70s, so there aren't many of us left, and I'm hoping to get this information out before, frankly, something happens to me. Um, let's keep on going. So what we're going to talk about today, some of you are going to find it uncomfortable. And I won't put you on the spot, but you're going to find it uncomfortable because you're going to notice the signature of how you trade. And you're going to say, oh, that's happened to me. And it's happened to me too many times. And only by recognizing that and then going back and studying it will you be able to break out of that habit. And only by breaking out of the habit of chasing price are you going to become a better trader, a more consistent trader. Too many times you're right about where the market's going, but you don't understand how the market fluctuates and the correct way to enter into the market on the edges. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's take a look. This is the S&P E-mini futures. This is through March, the closing of March 14th. This is a day only, a day only, five minute chart. So in Chicago time, it's 8.30 a.m. to 3.15, which is where the futures are traded in the pit, the few last standing gentlemen, so to speak. So you can take a look at this. This is literally only two days. And what can we do with this chart? Well, here's a beautiful line of force. It tells us price had a lot of energy, and it went one way, straight up. We can always go back and connect the bottoms here. We have this beautiful base. So this is a line of balance. It's a multi-pivot line. By that, I mean it grabs a number of bottoms and even some over here. It's been retested here. And then price came out. It's also the point of ignition. Price came out, and we had this beautiful run up. And then since then, we've slowly been pulling back. Now, this is one of the technical analysis things that I've brought out. This is a line of maximum excursion. I wish I could draw a little straighter. You connect the top with the first pullback, and generally it's a significant area, first of all. If it gets violated, it's a definite sign of a change in behavior, but often it, end, it ends up being significant resistance or support, depending on which side you're on, especially the first time it's tested. The longer the line is out there, the less likely it's going to 
be that significant. But early on, it's extremely useful. So if we're traders, let me get my cursor going here. There we go. If we're traders and we didn't participate in this move, our job as traders is to try and decide where is the pullback and where do I want to get long. I don't want to get long up here. I don't want to get long up here. Now let's think about this reasoning. Uh, where's my little cursor? Hang on one second here. I'll get it, Cynthia. You little rascal. There we go. I got it. There you have it. Okay. You okay. got it before I jumped in. Good, Tim. Yeah, I, I knew you were going, please grab the cursor. <laughs> I couldn't find it. Was right, it was hidden right in front of me. There we go. Okay, so <laughs> I don't want to buy up here. I'll quit drawing. How about that? It looks better. Um, I don't want to buy up here. I don't want to buy up here. Now, let's think about this for a second. By reason of induction, I really don't want to buy up here, do I? Stop and think about it for a second. This didn't work out too well after a straight run-up. If you miss it, you miss it. Remember, opportunity lost is just opportunity lost. doesn't cost you any money. If you miss a trade, there'll be another trade. And remember, these are five-minute bars, so there were plenty of opportunities. Now we come back up again. Now, maybe you had a reason to buy down here. But you don't want to buy up here. Maybe you had a reason to buy down here. But you don't want to buy up here. Period. The problem is keeping that thought in the back of your mind as price fluctuates. And one thing is as certain as the sun rises, price fluctuates. Sometimes the price fluctuation, fluctuation comes on its own. And sometimes it gets a little help from its friends, so to speak, the whales, the bigger traders. So let's draw in the down sloping median line just to get a feel for the probable path of price. And to draw a median line, we always have to have alternating pivots. We have to have a high, a low, and a high. Or if it was upsloping, we'd have to have a low, a high, and a low. In this case, I'm trying to figure out, and you should be trying to figure out, where is the pendulum pullback until we get below this line, this multi-pivot line right here? The trend is up. No damage has been done, even though we've got some moves down. And are there small trades to the downside where you could have made money? Sure. If you want to trade that way, that's fine. My job when I intraday trade is to try and trade with the trend. You have at least a 10% edge. So. In my opinion, until we break below this multi-pivot line, I'm going to try and find out where's a logical place to get long. And the one thing I don't want to do is buy one of these extremes. So I put in a, a median line, and it, it is telling me here's the probable path of price. Now, there's only one problem. We've now drifted outside the upper parallel and broken above it. This is the close of the day. And remember, these are day session only, not 24 hours. So don't email me and say, oh, my chart doesn't look like yours. Make sure you're looking at day session only, five-minute evening S&Ps. Here's the end of the day. And I like having the gaps. The gaps, as we talked about in the last presentation, you can go back and watch the uh, presentation. Gaps give us two pivots to work with. So I like having them. Now, as you go home for the day, if you're not going to trade the night session, and what I do, actually, I, I, I live in Arizona, and I literally live uh, uh, in a, on a mountain, and my trading room is actually cut out inside of the granite of the mountain. I'm inside inside of granite, and um, we call it the Bat Cave, just because it sounds cool. I lock the door to the Bat Cave at 4.30 because my kids are home. It's time to go enjoy my family, so I very seldom do anything at night. My brokers watch my orders overnight. They get I, they get past my charts as well as my orders, and I, I'm done. 
if I have open positions. If, they, if I get stopped out or prof, my profit targets get hit, that's fine with me. If you're not going to trade the night session and you're using day-only charts, you go home thinking, okay, well, it's broken above the upper parallel. It looks relatively strong. It's taken out a couple highs. I wonder what the morning's going to give me. Let's summarize what we know. Price has met its minimum downsize target. Let's go back and look at that. Andrew says, Dr. Alan Andrews says, with 80% certainty, this has been proved over and over. There are doctoral dissertations to prove it. I've done tens of thousands of iterations this year alone already. I always check this. But price makes the median line, or its most next most likely line, 80% of the time. And you can see here, price came off the upper parallel, started to take out lows. Where does it go? To the median line. It's met its objective. And by the way, once it heads up and starts to take out highs, its next objective is the upper parallel. It's meant that objective. So it's meant both objectives. And it has an 80% probability before it even takes off of meeting its objective. So once it takes off, you already have a leading indicator to tell you where it's headed. Price broke below the multi-pivot line. Let's see that. Here's my multi-pivot line. You can see I connected some highs a ton of lows, some highs, some lows and highs, some lows and highs. This is a nice balance line. Price came down, broke below it, but now it's recaptured it. Price has broken above some prior minor swing highs. I just showed you that. And now price has broken above and closed the day above the downsloping upper parallel. Let's look at it again. We no, let's, let's just go to the next slide. Is it time to draw an upsloping median line? Sure, let's draw one. No tricks here. I'm just going to use the last time we were down at the multi-pivot line. This is really the line of death, if you will. Of course, this is the year of 2012. The Mayans are calling this the year of death, so this is the line of death. If price breaks below here, the uptrend's probably over. This is the last time we were down testing it. You can see it closed successfully back above it. So I'm going to connect this low, our major high, and if this ends up being the low, this is our C pivot right here. And right now it's a if C pivot because we haven't taken out anything exciting. But if we do take out something exciting, this will be the C pivot. It's also what I would call a width median line because it grabs the entire pullback versus low, high, low. That would not be the width. This is a width median line because it grabs all of it. You can see our line of maximum excursion, which again should act as some resistance first time it's tested. But we've got a lot of things going for us on the upside. The blue median line gives us the probable path of price with the trend. Let's add them both together. Now we have an upsloping and downsloping median line. This also gives us lines of opposing force. Lines of opposing force means we have upsloping lines and downsloping lines, and where they meet can be significant. They're not all the time, especially when they're in the middle of nowhere. And you can see here, we're our, we've already moved. This ended up being a significant area or here, and we're already in a nice sustainable uptrend, so this is a meaningless pivot at this point. But take a look down here. This forces the C. That makes me like the C point even better because it's right at the median line, the downsloping median line, which is where price should run out of downside energy. And sure enough, it does. Now it's pulled out, the day's ended, and off to my right, about five bars, I've got another energy point right here, which is where the downsloping line crosses the upsloping line. This is the lower parallel, this is the upper parallel of these two median lines. This often acts as a price magnet, meaning price is often attracted to it. 
We'll watch that carefully. If price gets there, price will do, it almost never congests about 10% of the time. But the rest of the time, it either turns or accelerates, and it doesn't do it gently. You'll know right away. So let's see what we get. Oh, let's summarize what we know. You can tell that I'm not reading slides. I'm just, I'm going with exactly the slides you have, you have and you're going to get at the end of the day. Price is met its minimum dynamics on target, the median line. Price broke below the multi-pivot line, but it has now broken back above the multi-pivot line. Price has broken above some prior swing highs. Price has now broken above and closed the day above the downsloping upper parallel. Now, the upsloping blue median line is showing us a continuing upsloping probable path of price. Strap it in, boys and girls. It's time to learn what kind of trader you are. One thing I want you all to do as we go through this is to do some soul searching. And as you see price unfolds, I want you to ask yourself, do I do that? Or if you do, I want you to say, oh, you don't have to write it in, but I want you to say, yeah, I do that. I will take questions at the end. Otherwise, we'll never get done, believe me. We have lots of slides to go through. That's why I said this is going to be a fun one. <coughs> and I finished, you can ask Cynthia, I finished this one at 1 o'clock in the morning right before the deadline for uh, compliance. So <coughs> that, that's how much I liked this presentation. But you, you should really love it. You'll, there's lots to learn here. So this is 30 seconds after the opening of the morning session on this five-minute bar. What do we get? We gapped open higher. It's a beautiful gap open higher. How many of you are frothing at the bit saying, I love the way this closed. Now we've got a gap open higher. I can't wait to get long. Most of you. Most of you. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. And let's talk about it. Let's talk about what you do now as a trader. Most retail traders, and even medium-sized traders, chase price movement. Certainly most medium systems traders, they don't even think about it. Their system just goes go ahead and chases price. They've been watching their screen diligently, waiting for the official opening. If price gaps open higher, it's a sign of strength, a continuation of the strength of the previous day's close. If they aren't long on the opening, they soon will be long. Their long-term success depends on how they manage these urges, manage their intuition that this market is going higher. Now, larger professional traders, like me, known as whales in the business, know that most retail traders are likely to buy this market if price opens higher. They know that when the starting gate opens up, you guys are likely to run. Run for the finish line. Now, it's in their interest, it's in my interest, for the market to gap open higher. Why? I want you to chase price higher. They know that if the market gaps open higher, most retail, retail, most retail traders will be unable to show any patience. Their urge to get long will override any trading discipline they thought they had. That's just the truth. Now, this is when you're going to find out if you're guppy food for the whales or whether you started to manage yourself. And again, I don't mean this in a negative way to anyone. Please don't take it that way. I'm trying to get you to evaluate how you trade and watch how whales manipulate a market. So you can literally decide if you're reacting correctly to these manipulated movements. 
When whales gap open a market like this, we call it the twitching worm. Here's my question to all of you. What are you going to do 30 seconds after this open? Are you going to swallow the worm? David says, gulp. I don't know if that means he's nervous or it means he swallowed the worm. But you should all be asking yourself, when I see this price action, what do I do? What am I likely to do? Because that's extremely important. And there, of course, would be the worm. By the way, just so you know, today is the debut of my 11-year-old daughter Lucy's artwork. I was just going to use stock artwork, and she came in on Saturday before Easter and said, Hey, Dad, could I uh, could I do some of the artwork? And so uh, that's what make me happier. Gaps are usually filled. Actually, to be honest, there's very little statistical evidence that it's meaningful. It's not the gap. It's the price action. You should pay attention to gaps because you should pay attention to their lows and their highs because they are actual pivots. But in terms of, for example, there are systems that are set up that are trade, traded to fill gaps or not fill gaps, et cetera. They're, they're not successful in the long run. So here's the close of this five-minute bar. Many people that are here got long in the first 30 seconds at 13.90 and three quarters and got their report back from IB that they're long. Price closed at 13.89 and three quarters. Now, it's only one point. But what size stop do you use in the five minute E-mini S&Ps? Do you use a 50 point stop? 25 point stop? 10 point stop? 5 point stop? When I trade the E-mini S&Ps, I never trade with more than a 3 point stop. So if I had gotten long on the opening, I've already given away one-third of my stop just at the close of the first bar. Did you grab the twitching worm dangled by the whales? If you chase price on the opening or during those first 30 seconds of frenzied ticks, and the S&Ps are always frenzied on the opening, you're already sitting on a one-point loss. Why three points? And then I'm going to stop looking at questions. It has to do with volatility. I do a volatility measurement um, and since 1999 in the S&Ps, it hasn't changed. So I use th uh, th uh, three points in the S&Ps, and uh, that same amount of risk is calculated across all instruments for me. The trend hasn't changed. That may have been a good place to buy. But did you plan your trade or reach out and grab the twitching worm because you could not hold your instincts in check? Now remember, my maximum stop loss in the E-mini S&P is three minutes. That doesn't mean I have to use three, three. I could use two and a half, two, one and a half, but I never use more than three. So what's your maximum stop loss in the five minute E-mini S&P futures trade? You should have a maximum amount written down. People that are in my mentoring have to commit to always using a stop, always having a maximum stop loss in each market they trade and never violating it. You should never enter a trade without entering a protective stop loss order at the same time, which is pretty difficult to do if you're entering at the market because then you're, of course, also fumbling around afterwards trying to enter your stop in a frenzied market. Your entries, your stop loss orders, your profit targets, your risk reward calculated, and the type of trade that you are expecting this to turn into should all be planned and written down before any orders are placed into the market. And out of the hundreds of people here at the seminar, this webcast 
Almost none of you do this. And that's why so many of you end up being the cuppy food. Because you're reacting versus acting using a plan. Let's see how chasing the worm played out in this market. Next bar. Price now closes at 13.88 and a half. It's going to be down now over two points in just 10 minutes. You have filled the gap, if that's important to you. It's meaningless to me. I still note, and we'll go over this, if you go back to the prior webcast, which is, again, always the second Thursday of every month at IB, if you go back to the last webcast, we went over gaps and their importance and the high and low pivot inside the gap and how to use them. Just because the gap is filled doesn't mean that these points aren't important. What's important is how price reacts. And you can see it plunges right through. There are no buyers. The whales are not buying. The whales know that you got long here. They tricked you into getting long here. They twitched the worm. Next bar. Price closes at 1987.5. If you're using a three-point stop, maximum three-point stop, which of course I do, you have now been stopped out. If you chase price, you have been stopped out. Now, being stopped out in and of itself is not an, that important a thing. Use a stop religiously. Never trade without a stop. Have a planned amount. Don't just say, well, let me just throw the stop here. Have a planned maximum amount. It doesn't have to, you don't have to use your maximum amount. But what's key here is, look at where you're getting stopped out. A median line from a low, high, and low mathematically tells you that price should be running out of energy right in this area. And as I started out earlier with the maximum excursion line, I drew circles and I said, I don't want to get long here. I don't want to get long here. I don't want to get long here. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, where do I want to get long? Yes, Greg. This is an area where you should be scouting along. Perhaps not on the first bar, because look at it close. It closes actually below the outer parallel. So maybe you want to do what I call buying another bar and see if any buyers show up. If you see a continuation, price has not stalled, price has not turned, but price is instead accelerating, and you probably want no part of it. But let's see what we see. Did you grab the twitching worm dangle by the whales? If you chase price on the opening bar or during those first, look, if it sounds like repetitious, repetition is the mother of education. It's the best way to learn. In, at market geometry, we call it myelination. Repetition actually causes the nerve centers in your brain to be relocated. And it sets up a neural path of learning. And so we go over and over and over things. And in the last two weeks, we've been going over the twitching worm, and these are called washes and rinses. We've been going over this for two weeks for, for a purpose, because we want to burn it into people's memory. So not, not only do they not grab the twitching worm, but they know how to react and get long or short at the right place, along with the whales. If you chase price on the opening or during those first 30 seconds of frenzy ticks, you're now either stopped out or you're sitting on a three and a quarter point loss. Now remember, this is the five minute S&Ps. This is not the 20 minute, it's not the 60 minute, it's not the 240, it's not the daily. So you're not going for 50 handles. So you need to have a good risk reward. As I said, one of my earliest mentors, one of the people I'm most grateful to, Amos Hostetter, taught me never trade without at least a three to one risk reward ratio. If I'm trading with a three handle or big figure S&P stop, that means I expect to make at least nine handles or I will not take the trade, period. Not five handles, not six handles, not seven handles. I need to be looking at 2.7 or higher, but really three to one. 
If I don't think the three to one is realistic, I'm not going to bother to take the trade. I'll trade it on the market, or I'll pitch this pass. Maybe something will come up later. So if you're trading five minute S and P's and you've got a five minute five point stop in there, that means you're looking for at least fifteen handles. So you'll have to go back and look at the recent average true range on the daily E mini S and P's and see how realistic is that. And the way to do that is calculate about eighty percent of the range and say, Well, if I could grab eighty percent of the range, could I get fifteen handles? There aren't that many days when you can grab fifteen handles that are not news related. Two spike 20 point rallies or sell offs don't count because you probably wouldn't have been in. Now remember, the trend hasn't changed, but that wasn't a good place to buy in a five minute E mini S&P chart. We talked about why it wasn't. Now did you plan your trade or did you reach out and grab the twitching worm because you couldn't hold your instincts, your intuition in check. You know this thing is going up. You can feel it. If you've been trading any time at all, everything in your body says, this thing is going up and i got to get me some. But that doesn't mean you have to get it right now. That means you have to take a look at the market, you have to take a look at the charts, and you have to say, okay, what makes sense? This is a business. If the market goes up and you get stopped out, but it still goes up, you don't get any points. This is a business. The only points you get are the P&L at the end of the day. Didn't we have a way to measure the likely pullback in this uptrending market? In fact, didn't we have an area that was identified by lines of opposing force that should act as a magnet? How's that working? We had this in advance. I showed this before the market even opened. It was there. How's it working? Where did price get attracted to? To the penny. Price reaches the energy point. One bar after the two lines of opposing force. And my rule is three to five bars, plus or minus. The energy point. And it's right at where the lines of opposing force cross at 1387.5. It couldn't get any prettier than this. Remember, price is attracted to these areas. Now, let's see if price turns here or accelerates lower. You don't. You can just buy here if you have a stop. At the moment, where's your stop? And we'll, we'll have to go after Cynthia. That's going to have to be not our next one, which is going to be on options, but maybe when we do interest rate futures two from now. We'll have to include a section on market structure with bonds. This is the next swing low. So your next stop, your stop would have to be all the way down here. That's too expensive if you're using structure. So let's take a look and see what we get. Spy into the bar. Before, oh, let me see. Before we go any further, do you think it's wise to grab the twitchy room or take the time to plan out your trade? If you're using any type of consistent money management and using decent risk reward ratios and grabbed at the twitching room on the opening, you were stopped out for a loss on an opening likely set up by large professional traders, whales like me, that used your intuition or emotions against you for a two or three and a half, three and a quarter point loss. Now, let's watch how price played out and if planning a trade at areas where you could expect price to pull back if that would have worked better. Greg wants me to discuss stop placement and away from where they normally hunt. More important, Greg, I'm going to show you where the whales are going to buy, where I'm going to buy, which makes it much safer. This is people buying a twitching worm, and here he is. Just to remind everybody, because most, pe most people here are buying the twitching worm. Price closes on the second bar. Here, here we are testing the energy point. And we closed at 1387.5, right at the energy point. Here's the next bar. It closes at 
1388 and a quarter. So it's up three quarters of a handle. And you can see we left double bottoms. I call those basically mirror bars. Alternating closes, about the same size bars. Next bar. So if you had planned to trade in the area, and again, this is more about reading than it is about an actual trade, but the trade should be down here where the whales are going to play. Next close, 1389 and a half, two handles above the energy point. We'll skip a few bars. Price closes at 1389. Now, down here, we really didn't have any stop other than all the way down at sea. But if you didn't like buying at the energy point, or missed it, or you didn't like to stop, you could have used this area, which is again, this lower parallel that's already been tested, and put a stop right underneath the double bottoms at the energy point. It's not important that they're double bottoms. It's just that price came back, it, it price came to the energy point and tested it, then it tested it again, was, un, one, was unable to make a lower low, and came out of the hole. Well, here's our pullback. This is our secondary entry. So you could have gotten long at 1389. Let's see how that works out. You can see we skipped ahead a few bars. We come right out of the hole with a nice wide range bar. We consolidate a little bit to regain some energy. Price closes at 1393. Now you're up four e-mini S&P handles. Here's the twitching worm. Most people grabbed at the twitching worm in the first 30 seconds and got stopped out. And generally, unfortunately, once they get stopped out, they don't have the focus and the emotional stability to take a breath, walk away, come back, sit down, clear their head, and then get back in the game. Price closes at 1393. Next, excuse me. Now looking back, was it wise to grab the twitching worm or to take the time to plan out your trade? We're going to take another look at this very same trade using slightly different techniques. Why? Again, repetition is the mother of all education. And you'll get to see how it played out through the end of the day. If you grab the twitching worm on the opening, you were stopped out for a loss on an opening likely set up by large professional traders or whales like me that used your intuitions or emotions against you for a two to three and a quarter point loss. I can't iterate this enough. We do this over and over and over in these markets. Professional traders took advantage of price imbalances, and that's what caused this higher opening gap in the market. Too many traders were bullish and wanted to get long at the opening. No, we're not doing anything illegal. We just bought right before the official opening, that's all. Knowing that when the bell went ding, 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 many of you would jump in. You weren't going to jump in until the bell went ding, ding, ding. So we bought before the bell. With a little planning, using simple tools that are actual leading indicators, as opposed to lagging indicators and managing your emotions, it would have been very easy to get long at 1387 and a half, which is the energy point, or 1389 with a very manageable stop. In fact, my trading, my, my partner at Market Geometry, this was an actual live trade that he took and that we discussed and dissected during the live sessions at Market Geometry. And then we went through it in its entirety the following day, which is a Friday. I know many of you cannot resist grabbing the twitching worm, but if you want to become more consistently profitable, you will have to learn to manage your urges. So Shane got along on the pullback. I did the wash and rinse on the opening and bought at the energy point.
Now, let's look at this same trade. I know a lot of you are writing, but if again, if I read right now, we're liable to be here until 2 o'clock in the afternoon and Cynthia will be asleep. <clears throat> let's get to the end and then I'll take questions. Let's look at this same trade using the insight from Dr. Andrews' original course and see if we can shed further light. Maybe approaching the same trade with this additional knowledge will make it easier to see why chasing price is generally a losing proposition. Here we go. Frequently, after crossing an upper MLH, which is the upper parallel, price continues to fall along this upper parallel before the further rise that was signaled by passing through the upper parallel. In other words, we're likely to see some motion and then some travel down, and then we'll get our rise that was signaled by this move above the upper parallel. In other words, you don't have to be in a hurry. It's likely to come back and retest it, and it may even trade down it follow it along. We call this a switchback. You're on the other side of this upper parallel. And you can expect some movement against it before it slingshots out of the hole. Frequently after crossing an upper me median line parallel, prices continue to fall along the upper median line before the further rise that was signaled by passing through the upper MLH. Now I have one other question for everybody. When we see this wide range bar that cracks or breaks below the median line, if you can erase these bars from your mind, or when you print them out yourself and look at them after the session, put a piece of paper over them and just go to this one wide range bar that spikes lower, makes a new low for the move, and closes on its low and breaks below the median line. If this rascal is headed lower, as you look at it at the end of the day, why is price up here? We call this a swing failure. This is a major failure for price to do what it's supposed to do. This swing, especially when it had this wide range bar lower that closed on its low, should have resulted in significant downside movement. Instead, that was the termination of the downside move, and we rocketed out of there. That ought to be the first thing on your agenda to think about the following day. Okay, price gaps open higher. Traders get impatient and they chase price higher on the opening. So many of you do this. I don't even want you to raise your hands. But you know you do. Price will generally come back to retest a zoomed median line or upper or lower parallel. This is generally a high probability area to enter positions or if you didn't have a stop loss and to take losses if they, or if they weren't executed to take your loss. This is a high probability area. We zoom through, it's likely with 80% probability it will come back and retest it. So why would you want to buy up here? Remember we had the maximum line of excursion and I said I don't want to buy up here after this rise. I don't want to buy after this rise. I don't want to buy after this rise. I know with high certainty it's going to come back and retest this upper parallel. I've got that in the back of my mind. This is a different median line, this green one, than I had it before, yet it still gives me the same energy point. There is a high probability, this is directly from Alan Andrews' course, you can see it at marketgeometry.com or medianline.com. Under free resources, you can read his entire 61-page course. There's somebody selling it for $5,000. We, we just give it away free. You can print it out 
in a nice PDF fashion. Dr. Anders sold it for $1,500 in 1965. You can go ahead and just print it out and read it and study it. Prices will reach the latest ML or MLH, meaning the median line or the upper or lower parallel, number one. Two, prices will either reverse through the median line or gap through it. Frequently after crossing a median line or a lower or upper median line parallel, prices continue to rise along the median line or upper or lower median line parallel before the further drop or rise that was signaled by passing through. In other words, price signaled it was going higher, but it generally comes back and retests first. That's the rhythm of the market. That's the language of the market. We can use that if we pay attention rather than chasing the market. All right, let's see what happens. The people that chase the market got stopped out. Now price makes a new high. In fact, we get this huge wide range bar, this zoom bar. And what does it do? Pay attention, same thing here. It zoomed an upper parallel. What do we know about that? We just talked about it. When it zooms a median line or an upper or lower parallel, with 80% certainty, it's likely to come back and retest it. But, once again, this is people chasing price. I have to get long. I got stopped out down, long, down here. Oh my God, it's making new highs. Please let me in. Okay, I'm in. Or I sat on the sidelines. Now it's making new high. I must get in. So they're buying that. It also took out this high. When it took out this high, the breakout buyers jumped into the market and can't help themselves. They must get long. They have to get long. There's no way they can sit on the sidelines. It's not possible. Everything, every urge you have, every intuition tells you it'll never go down again. This market is rising and it's going to keep rising like a meteor straight up to the sky. The market doesn't trade that way. Remember what we just learned. When price zooms through an upper or lower parallel or the median line, it'll come back and retest it 80% of the time. So the chasers bought here, they got stopped out. Now they're long again up here. Let's see what happens to them. What does it do? Price comes right back down to the upper parallel. 80% of the time, it will come right back down and retest the upper parallel. Now we've got a scary outside wide, wide range bar. If you chase price, be honest with yourself. How do you feel when this bar prints? Take a look at it. Widest range bar, closes on its low, took out all the congestion. Your stomach's doing flip-flops, isn't it? Especially if you chase this one and got stopped out, and you chase this one, and now price is here. Your stomach's doing flip-flops. You're turned around. You're chasing your tail. You don't know what to do. Let me give you a clue. Always keep this in mind. What is the trend? The trend, until we break below, this line of balance is up, period. And your job as a trader is to identify high probability areas to get long until the trend changes. Along with that, those entries must have money management and good risk reward. That's your job as a trader. Once again, the people that chase price get stopped out. But believe me, people will go back to the well. And people are chasing price again for the third time right here. How'd that work for them? 
Look at this wide range, scary bar lower. The people that chase price for the third time get stopped out again. It continues again. One, two, three times. Now, one more time. After a zoom and retest, after a zoom, by the retest in an uptrend. So here we are. We zoom, come down, wait and buy the retest. We zoom, we come down, wait for some strength. Don't just put your buy order in. Wait for some strength. Now you've got your strength. Where are you going to put your buy order? Don't buy up here. Put it at the upper parallel, which is going to get retested 80% of the time with a stop underneath this low, which is the same as this low. Once this high gets taken out, the buyers that were down here move their buy orders to this area. Once this high gets taken out, we're up here, we leave a low, we come back up, where are they willing to buy? Well, this looks too far away they're going to move, at least some of them are going to move their buy orders up. That's why it slows down in this area. But we know when price zooms past the upper parallel, with 80% probability, it's going to come back and retest it. When price zooms through the upper parallel with 80 in an uptrend again, that's the key in an uptrend, with 80% probability, it's going to come back and retest the upper parallel. Don't just buy it naked. Wait until you see some buyers. Where do you see some buyers? When it starts to take out some highs. And you know this median line is working. This is a modified shift median line, which means price has been, the A point has been moved up 50% and over 50%. You can see a demonstration of that in last month's seminar. <coughs> Excuse me. Price comes and makes the median line of this modified shift, meaning it did its job, so we know it's working, what does it do? It comes right back down to the energy point. You have a beautiful stop. Price is left to a stop. We call this making a stop. This is a mature market structure. There should be buyers here. This is where you want to get along. Not up here. Not up here. You don't want to chase price. Let's see how that works out. Well, first, don't the chasers ever learn? It's the nature of the market. We call it minor into major. This is part of the language of price. When the chasers are jumping in, price is running out of upside directional energy. Then price pulls back, generally enough to cause the chasers to get stopped out. But their stop levels are usually where the major trend reasserts its pull and directional energy, energy with the trend, which in this case is up, is restored. As the minor pullback ends, the major trend begins again. If you only keep your eyes on the minor, you are likely to run into the major. Here's my 11-year-old daughter's take on minor into major. See if this helps you. Mmm, look at that nice fishy. This is all of you. Look at that nice food. Swimming by me. Oh, I almost got it. Let me get some. Oh, it's just about in my mouth. Okay, I'm ready to eat now. I've got it in my sights. Let me just get a nice bit of lunch here. Oops. No, Vlad, it's not delicious. You just ran in to the whales. Instead of eating lunch, you became lunch. Thank you, Lucy. The truth about most retail traders. 
They don't take the time to plan their trade before putting in orders. Too many of them enter, quote, at the market, quote, when their intuition tells them the price is getting away from them. Only after, after they enter at the market do they do any trade analysis, if they do any at all. And most of you don't do any at all. You just see it go up and you buy. You see it go down, you sell. They are often right about the direction of the market, but they often get stopped out before the market makes the moves they thought it was going to make because they're trading the minor, not the major, and they run right into the major, of course. The few times they're right only reinforces this type of shoot from the hip behavior, unfortunately. They have no idea that the larger players, the whales, take advantage of these tendencies. And like a smaller fish chasing a guppy, they never see the whale right in front of them. Now, you need to ask yourself, what kind of trader are you? Are you the little fish being chased by the smaller fish? Are you the smaller fish chasing the little fish that doesn't see the whale? Or are you capable of planning out a trade? You don't have to be the whale, but you can trade with the whales by planning out your trades. Phil says he wants to swim next to the whale. Well, if you want to swim next to the whale, all you have to do is plan out your trades and say, look, I'm not buying on these extremes. These are the edges. I'm going to wait for price to get back into balance. If I miss a trade, I miss a trade. That's okay. Don't let that intuition, you get that intuition or that urge that, oh, my God, if I don't get long, I'm going to miss it. If you, first of all, if you miss it, it's okay. There'll be another one. But almost always, you won't miss it. My energy chi master, Gary, he's an Aikido master and has been practicing Aikido since he was five years old. He was stalking a pound trade. Uh, I saw him. He's also my acupuncturist. I was stalking a pound trade several days ago, and we were talking about it. And uh, in between sticking needles in me, he was showing me the chart, and we were talking about it. And he said, do you think it'll come back? Uh, just missed me by a couple pips, and now it's a couple hundred pips higher. Do you think it'll come back? And I said, 80% of the time it'll come back, Gary. Just leave your order there and let it happen. So I went in to see him yesterday, and he said, came back, filled me, went about 10 pips through me. Nowhere near my stop, it's up 300 pips. The, the name of Andrew's course is the Action Reaction Course, and it's on medianline.com or marketgeometry.com. Whatever you do, please don't go out and buy it. It's free on our, and it's in a PDF format on our site. Just go grab it free. It's there for everybody. Same instrument, different time frames, same behavior. This is such excellent charting. There's a reason I have the partner I have. I cannot provide the link. Just go to www. Well, I'll, you know what? I'll type it at the end. Do me a favor, G GM. Just ask me at the end, and I, I will provide the link, but I, not right now. Um, there's a reason I chose af after 40 years. Do you believe this? I chose, and we just celebrated our two-year anniversary. I didn't have a partner for 39 years. There's a reason why I waited. Somebody that had been with me for 12 years, I considered myself to be the best chartist in the world. And I certainly know the top 10 or the, the best chartists there are around the world. And Shane, my partner, can chart with the best of them, including me. Absolutely. So now, let's take a look. As I said, I was doing these at 1 o'clock in the morning on Easter evening. Thank you, Keith. Um, because I was ill the day before, um, and I just didn't have time to finish things. But I wanted to get these in. These drawings are so good, and this should drive more of the market geometry on to you and help you myelinate or help you build those neural cells. So let's take a look at this. One of these is the weekly E-mini S&Ps. And one of these is the seven minute E mini S and P's.
look pretty similar, don't they? Well, just hold on to your hats. Can you guess which one is which? First of all, which one is which? First of all, anybody? Wait a minute, time. I can slow down now. Weekly is left. Anybody else? Left is weekly. Okay. Any other guesses? Seven minute is okay. Seems to be right is weekly. Okay, so we can't tell. You know, if you showed them to me, I would say I can't tell. Some people guessed right, some people guessed wrong. It's not important. That's that. That's the truth. Those of you who guessed weekly, this was the weekly. Those of you who guessed seven minutes, this is the seven-minute chart. But take a look. Look at what price is doing. It bubbles up, comes right back down into balance. You don't have to buy this area because 80% of the time it's going to come back and retest. Now you can enter this area with a stop. Price bubbles up, comes back into balance. You don't have to enter at this one if you don't want to, though you could, but now it gives you a stop. And you can come in on the retest. Now it bubbles back up. Same thing on the seven minute. Price zooms through, what do we know about it? It's likely to come back and retest it. You can buy one of these if you want, or you can wait for it to show strength and then retest it with a beautiful stop. It showed a great deal of strength and comes back down on a scary drop, but it comes right back where it should run out of downside directional energy, leaves you a beautiful stop, and then the uptrend, the major, continues. Price bubbles up. What does it do? Pulls back. Right to balance. Right to the center. Right to the median line. We work our way higher. We come back. You're all good. You're ready to play. You can put your stop here. You can put your stop here. doesn't matter. You're all good to go. But you don't have to be chasing price. You don't have to get all excited. Oh my God, I'll never miss it. It'll never come back down. Yes, it does. Oh, if I don't get long, look at it go. It's breaking this, making new highs. i got to get long. Oh, it'll never come back down. Yes, it does. And let me plant this in your mind one more time. If you miss it, it's only an opportunity lost. It's not money out of your account. There will always be another trade. But generally, it comes back anyway. And when it comes back, it leaves you a natural stop. A stop built on market structure, not a cash stop, which is a guess of how far of how, how far price will go. Excuse me, I need a drink of tea. One second. This is the language of price. We talk about this live three days a week. We show, for example, two weeks ago we were talking about the S&Ps on the dailies and weeklies have bubbled up again. Well, in fact, we'll get there in a second. And I said if you go back and look at 1934, everybody talks about the 1929 Great Depression. All the money was lost, actually, in 1934. And we were all stretched out two weeks ago to the upside. And then we had five or six days straight uh, pullback now. And I guess we broke that streak yesterday, but we'll see how that goes. I, again, I'm not prognosticating. Um, I have my own opinions, but it really doesn't matter what I think. I'm just going to practice what price tells me to practice. But... Price was stretched out. What do we do for? We're due for a pullback. Let's see how that looks. This is a really useful tool. Thank you, James, by the way. Nice to see you. All they did here on the weekly and the seven-minute 
is take off the price bars and leave the actual swings. And when you practice or when you look at charts and you're doing your research, and you all should be practicing and doing your research, this is a very useful tool. In Ensign, it's just hit B and they disappear. But lots of charting programs allow you to do this. And then you can really see that this is the same action over and over and over. And you can, you can see price bubble up. And you can see where you've chased price. And you can see that we're making higher highs and higher lows, higher highs and higher lows. It all comes into focus without all that noise. And when you trade, you need to get to the point where even though those little bars are, let's go back one, even though the little bars are forming, this is what you're paying attention to in your mind. Higher highs, higher lows. Where is the likely pullback? When are we stretched to the edge and likely to pull back? Where are we likely to run out of downside directional energy because we're making higher highs and higher lows? Where are we stretched out and likely to turn and make a pullback to a good buying opportunity? This is what you should be seeing and feeling. This will keep you from chasing price. Here's the bars again. Higher highs, higher lows. These are the swings. Higher highs, higher lows. Higher highs, higher lows. Higher highs, higher lows. Take uh, several hours and randomly pick charts, stocks, commodities, any time frame. You'll do yourself a service if you just take time to mark out market structure. And the easiest way is to just mark out the highs and the lows and watch how price reacts around them and whether or not it's changing trend or the trend pulls back but stays within the trend, doesn't violate any of the lows, pulls back to balance, heads back off. Pulls back to balance, heads back off. You'll learn so much about the market. Jeffrey just put up, by the way, Omnium Software, which is just chart overlay. It's a magnificent, yes. Carrie is a good friend of ours, and we have a good relationship with him. I absolutely recommend this, this software. It allows you to draw off of anybody else's chart that they send you or the charts that you're about to get from me. You can put it on. It'll do trends. It'll do uh, – he, he specifically built it for median lines, all the different median lines. It's done wonderfully. You can overlay it, for example, on IB's charting software and draw right on their charts. So somebody was saying they don't have the tools. Well, you can use chart overlay. But also I'm going to get with Cynthia this month, and we're going to show you how to use simple lines because before 1995, no, no charting program out there had median lines. It took me to push several people. Tom Joseph is advanced get, which became eSignal, and some other people to start offering Andrew's pitchforks. And of course, now everybody offers them. They're very popular. You even see them on CNBC. But you can draw them using simple lines. So, and, uh, so Cynthia and I are going to sit down with the IB software and show you how she's going to ask me questions and guide me through it. And we'll show you how to do it just using simple line tools. It's very simple to do. And by the way, drawing them that way, you'll learn a lot. But if you want a quick, powerful piece of software that allows you to draw right out, right over anybody's charts, including IB's chart overlay, and there's a link to it. It's, it's inexpensive, and it's a very good piece of software. And I, I, own, I don't own the company. They're just built well, that's all. I recommend it to students that, that don't have the charting material that they need. Well, let's take a look at this in, in another way. Here's our change in behavior. We finally break a swing high. This is on the weekly. We bubble up. We make a new swing high. We pull back to balance. Now, this swing high doesn't become confirmed, and this swing low doesn't be confirmed until this swing high gets taked out, taken out, which confirms the swing low. Then we take out this swing high, confirms the swing low. Come back, leave a low take it out, that confirms everything. So one confirms the other. 
One confirms the other. It's yin and yang, back and forth. Very simplified method. I know there are people out there that count like four bars minimum and all that other stuff. This is very, very simple. It's very easy. Here's our change of behavior. Take a look at the seven minute. Change of behavior. Here's our prior high. Suddenly we start to take out the prior high. What do we do? We bubble up. We pull back to balance. We leave a swing low. It's going to become a swing low. When? When we take out the prior high. That makes this a swing low. We pull back to balance. We stop where we should. We bubble back up. Start learning to mark your charts like this. It'll keep you from getting long up here. It'll keep you from buying this high. It'll keep you from chasing this. It'll have you sitting in the weeds over here at this pullback or over here at this pullback saying, this is the gift. Thank you very much. I've got a tight stop. And look how far ahead of the game you are. There is no rest of the Andrews course. Dr. Andrews course was 61 pages. Anybody that tells you anything other than that is A, a shyster, if you don't know what that means, look it up, and B, to simplify it, a liar. There are 61 pages. That's all there is. I'm one of the original students in the Coral Gables group. Anybody that tells you anything different is lying and trying to sell you a bunch of crap. Pardon my language, Cynthia, but they're trying to sell it to you for $10,000. Stay away. Yes. We, one of the other Andrew students says, recite it out loud. Do not chase the $10,000 junk. It's 61 pages, and it's all there, period. In fact, the copy that you see came from five students. We put together the five best looking from the five copies of each of each page. We took put together the best one. They were all in pretty bad shape. This is archived, yes, you'll be able to pull, watch the whole thing as well as get the slides. Don't worry about it, Dan. All right, so now let's take a look at a weekly. We looked at the seven minute and the weekly side by side. Let's take a look at the weekly. Same playbook for August 2010 and August 2011. The same thing happened in 2010, right here. And if you pay attention, it happened in 2011, and it's playing out, it's finishing out right now. So once again, if you pay attention, this replays in any time frame, in any instrument, anything that fluctuates, including you can use median lines and this type of market behavior on and chart the unemployment rate, and you'll be amazed how well it works. You can chart baseball batting averages, and it charts well. Anything that fluctuates. You can use it on equity curves. Absolutely right, Al. So take a look. August 2010, right down here. High drama, the market's crashing. See the high drama? The market's crashing. Oh, my God. It's, you know, the euro crisis. It's a flash crash. Everybody's, the world's over. This is going to be the big turn. What does it turn out to be? This is the minor into the major. Right back down. If you don't want to buy here, wait for the retest. Now you've got to stop. Minor into major. Major volatility at those lows, and lots of bad news were coming out. That's your key. Then, what do we get? Smooth, grinding momentum out of it. We make a high, we get a small bump. And then we continue to grind higher. What do we get? gets to be 2011, oh my God, Europe is over. 
everybody, I, I guess the, everybody thought everybody's going to leave Europe and disappear. All the money's going to disappear, et cetera, et cetera. But what happened? Scary drama, big drop, a lot of money to be made. Don't don't get me wrong. There's still were plenty of money if you wanted to get short and you were capable of getting short up here. However, this is, in a certain sense, minor right into major. This, once you learn this technique, and learn not to chase the markets is easy. The person managing your IRA got you long up here, I'm telling you, because they're chasing their rate of return so that they can get rated higher. They missed this opportunity, so now they're buying up here. They're chasing performance. And if you're investing with a CTA, rather than wait for him to have a pullback in his performance, you're buying him at the top of his performance. He's one of the top performing IRA. Uh, CTAs of the of the year. Well, let me just put some money in this account. Well, next time wait for a pullback. It's the same thing. Anything that fluctuates, wait for your pullback, then get in. And what do we have here? With the, all the European drama, what does price do? Right back from minor minor pullback, right into the major. If you didn't want to buy the first area, which acted as support before, because you thought the stop was too large, well. Wait for a sign of buyers, and it comes right back. And on this big, scary drop, you can be sitting in the weeds with a small stop, and you're playing the major, not worrying about the minor. Now, of course, what do we have? And Mary just gave you another downloadable, which is in PDF. It's a gorgeous version. Price comes up, and here we are. This is this is relatively updated, except for the recent bump. We've now pulled down nicely. Anybody give me the Dow? Somebody give me the Dow price at the moment. I'm sorry, the E-mini price at the moment. Can you just flash that to me. I don't have my, thank you, 1383. So we bumped and we're pulling back right in this area. Actually, this is a month old. We've been higher. So I pardon me for not updating. As I said, I had to grab this from Shane directly because it was one in the morning at some point I had to get some sleep. But we ran up higher. Now we've had a nice sell off. The question now is, is that it? Or are we going to pull back into the major? Let price tell you. I'm not going to pro pro prognosticate. I don't know. Price will tell you. But do you want to get long up here? Or do you want to wait for minor into major? wasn't as long as I thought it was. Hour and a half is not so bad, Cynthia, for me. Um, questions? Do you want to do a poll first, uh, Cynthia? Yes, I would. I'm going to give you a chance. Uh, there are a lot of questions that have been coming in, Tim. So while you're reading through those questions, I'm going to actually open up a poll on everyone's machine. And uh, this is because Interactive Brokers Management has asked me to run this in each event. So if you found the information in today's webinar helpful, please simply uh, indicate that within the polling panel. Now there's also a section there for comments and suggestions. Don't put your questions there. Tim won't be able to see it. Um, but if you do have comments or other topics you'd like to see covered during our webinars, that's a perfect place to put it in. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yet vote quick, exactly. Thank you, Tim, because you do have only about 10 seconds left to complete it. So once you make your selection, please go ahead and click the Submit button in the lower right-hand corner of that box. That actually allows me to compile your results. So thanks, everyone. Poll did just end. Now, you can close that poll so that you can actually view the, po uh, the chat panel and send Tim some of your questions. Simply use the X in the um, to the right-hand side of that poll panel title bar. That will remove it from your screen so that you can access that chat. Uh, Back great. to you, Tim. Okay. Uh, well, here's here's the, one of the most important things. 
one of the reasons, actually the reason I, listen, I don't, ha I don't, IB is not my broker, and I'm, I don't mean that in a negative way, okay, because of my clients, IB is not my broker. I, I also don't work for IB. I don't get any money from IB. The only reason I work with IB is because I get to work with Cynthia, okay? <laughs> Cynthia, no, oh, don't laugh. Cynthia is, oh, thank you, Tim. <laughs> is one of the best educators available, okay? She puts together such great material. She gets people, whether or not you like me or not, she gets such great speakers on a regular basis. And it, at no time did you hear Cynthia pushing IB products. No, at no time did you hear us say, you know, come and buy a book at Market Geometry or come and buy a DVD. I don't care about any of that. You know, I'm here to give back, and so is Cynthia. Cynthia is here to help you become educated, period. And I, you know, I am willing to give her all the time of the day. So any time you write IB or any time you see one of these polls, please put in their webinar or Cynthia. Mention that because it gives her more power. It allows her, if you will, to bring more people in, to bring me back m more often. She's now doing, uh, we have this great thing with the CME where on the last Thursday of the month, they have Futures University, I believe it's called. You, you can correct me, Cynthia. And School of Futures is what we're School calling it. Thank you. And to give, they, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, to give those who may not be interested in futures some in, more in-depth information. But since Tim has mentioned the School of Futures, I also want you to know that we're going to follow each of those courses with Tim's on the second Thursday of every month, where he's going to examine, as he did today with the um, stock index futures, he'll take a look at and will focus on that particular product. So make sure, if you are interested, um, do be aware Tim's going to be joining us second Tuesday of every month, and then also the School of Futures, both brought to you by the generosity of the CME. So thanks, everyone. But back to you, Tim. They've got a okay. lot of questions. Okay, absolutely. And, and, and so what we try and do is we try and follow up the educational portion that the CME has put together on the last Thursday, with the second Thursday following. So the second Thursday of each month, and we use the same instrument, and we try and show you the practicality. This is how it's traded. This is how to trade it. And, and hopefully the back and forth will help people, especially people that are just getting along with it. So let's see if we can get some questions. And I'll, I'll answer questions until you're done. It doesn't bother me. This is, this is Cynthia Day. I want this, this, on this, the second Thursday of every month, is, as long as Cynthia will have me, I will just keep answering questions until we run out of questions. Um, let's see. Uh, and there's a, I've already said that Cynthia and I are going to do, honest to God, Cynthia and I are going to are going to sit down and do a go to meeting thing or a, or a, uh, um, a WebEx thing and sit down and draw medians by hand, meeting lines by hand, and show you you can do it on IB's platform already. If you don't want to do that. Somebody gave a beautiful link to um, chart overlay. You can use that as well, but we're going to show you how to draw. And then on top of that, they're already in the background working on developing median lines. It's just that they have a full plate. They're very busy right now, but we'll get it. Don't worry about it. Um, so let's see. I got This is a long list of questions. Let me fly back up here. Um, there's people telling me to get the pointer. It must be near the beginning. Um, okay. Stop placement. When you plan your trades, the very first thing you want to ask yourself is, where are the large buyers and large sellers likely to be in this time frame? It's the very first thing you want to ask yourself. And the reason why you want to ask yourself is, if you, if you consider that you can identify that there are large buyers at some point, and this is an uptrend, then you want to get long and you want to be able to put your stop below where they are likely to be buying. Because in that time frame, it's unlikely the price is going to go through their stops. Now, that doesn't mean you won't have losses. Let's not kid yourself. I have a lifetime percentage winning rate of 66%. But that means one third of the time I'm wrong. So even if you're very good, you're going to be wrong sometimes, at least a third of the time, I would guess. You have to use stops. But 
if you can use areas where there are large traders and hide your stops underneath, so many times it'll save you, and you'll be shocked. It'll be like a pip or two. You might as I mean, it's like buying insurance. If you can get it and it's not too expensive, absolutely use it. So put that in your mind when you try and place your stops. Um, okay. Brian says, after buying the extra bar at the energy point and deciding to enter there, what kind of cash stop would you use on that? You mentioned plus or minus five ticks around the energy point. Well, what I said was five plus or minus three to five bars. So if there's an energy point, once it gets five bars past the energy point, I, at that point I'll quit looking at it. Um, price in this case stopped to the tick on that energy point. Would you do it a few, like six or seven ticks to the energy point? Okay. I would not get too close to it. If I was going to use a cash stop, I never use a cash stop less than one and a quarter handles, which is five ticks. So I would never use one less than that because that's the noise in the S&Ps. I would probably have one about, to be honest with you, because I was looking for a good nine, ten handles, two, two and a half points below there. Um, let's see. How do we know that we've drawn the correct median line according to market structure? What if the energy point does not work or is wrong? Price does not reach there. Well, first of all, energy point is just an added luxury, okay? You don't always get energy points, and I don't lean on them that much. It's nice to have them. If you draw up sloping and down sloping lines, sometimes you get them. Sometimes you get them, but they're so far out of reach, it doesn't matter. The, and, more importantly, they need to be with the trend if you're going to use them. How do you know if you're drawing the, with the correct median lines? In this case, when you go back and review it afterwards, grab the PDF as you exit. Do yourself a favor. You don't have to print it out. You can grab it as a, as a, as a, a uh, file. Grab the file. Open up the PDF. Take a look at it. The key, really, is that if you look, I used nothing. This wasn't magic. I didn't use some inside, some goofy inside. You'll see people on forums. They draw some of these median lines that have like an A point that's in the middle of nowhere. It's in the middle of the trend. And you go, well, how did they do that? Well, here's how they did that. They're not doing median lines. They're doing channels. They just want the top and bottom to line up with other tops and bottoms further on down to the right. But if you draw median lines off of the extremes, which is what I did today, they have a mathematical probability. All I did was I used the point of ignition where price blasted off to the upside, then I used the highest high and the highest low. Nothing special about that. If you do that, you're catching price action 90% of the time. You don't need anything more fancy than that. You can learn other things, that's fine, and we certainly teach them at market geometry. But 90% of the time, that's all you need. Um, let's see. We already gave links to the action reaction course. I already told you that uh, I, IB, uh, Cynthia and I are going to sit down and do a, a video. Cynthia, put that on your uh, calendar. You got it, Tim. Just let me know. All right, let's see. Uh, I Okay, please do me a favor. I don't come to the Fibonacci uh, courses, and I don't come to Tom DeMarc's courses, et cetera, et cetera. If you want something from Tom DeMarc, go to Tom DeMarc's thing. I, I, I'm not saying anything bad or good about him or Fib people or anybody else. Just do that there, please, and pay attention to what we're doing. Well, let's see. This is the fractal nature pace? Absolutely. And, and the way we view it is, um, again, this is from Dr. Andrews. These techniques work on any price series. It means it doesn't even have to be commodities or stocks. Anything that fluctuates. So as I said, you can do this on your P&L. You can do this on the unemployment numbers. You can do this on baseball scores. You can, you can do this on, if you're now a... Uh, Let's see, the Angels now have Albert Pujols because I saw him at uh, spring training when I was trying to watch the White Sox game and all I could hear was, Albert, Albert. You can chart Albert's batting average 
and put a median line on it, and you'd be shocked how well it works. So there you go. Uh, I've already told you there's 61 pages. They're up. There's only one 61 pages. Anybody that tells you anything different, there were some weekly updates that were sent out, but they're really they're pretty meaningless. It's basically, uh, you know, goals up, this is blah, blah, blah. And uh, do I have more of Dr. Anders' material? I have more than a million pages. Let me say it again, more than a million pages. But the 61-page action reaction course, it's up at the it's up at medianline.com and market geometry, and the links are here. Um, Arturo says the distance between the median line, low, and high lines have any relationship with Fibonacci? No, and and Elliot? No. They have no relationship with either. They're meaning to me Fibonacci and Elliot are meaningless. No offense. Other than, I'd love to know where their orders are, the, the Fibonacci players especially, because a lot of small retail players play the, you know, the, the Fibonacci numbers. I want to know where those numbers are, generally because I like to run their stops. But it has nothing to do with Fibonacci or Elliott Wave at all, in any way, shape, or form. And thank you, Mary, for putting up that link. Oh, I can't see. There's got to be some more here. Sorry. Right, so, oh, Shane wanted to remind me privately. If you go to marketgeometry.com and look at the blog section, which is right in the center, you'll see a current chart of the weekly S&P, and you'll see exactly what's going on, and you'll see the minor and the major movement going on up to date. So do yourself a favor. Afterwards, just pop over, and it's not to, I'm not trying to sell you anything. Just go to the blog section, and there's an updated slide that Shane was gracious enough to upload this morning that will show you exactly major, minor into major, and exactly where we are price-wise. Thank you, Shane. Um, did, I, did Amos, here's a good question, did Amos Hostetter use median lines too? He knew about them because I showed them to him. Did he use them? No. I know what he used. I'm not going to talk about it. It's not particularly meaningful. Amos's um, gift to the world of technical analysis as well as well, trading in general was the theory of risk reward as well as advanced position sizing. And I have, I don't want to say to my shame, I've kept it to myself actually until the last year or so. But the biggest reason is because it's taken me, literally, you know, we, we, we have people at Market Geometry from 87 countries, and Cynthia's had, uh, some of these, Cynthia, you get 30 and 40 countries, at the, people from 30 to 40 countries at these. And I know the account sizes are not $10 million, $50 million, or if you had Amos's account, you don't want to know how much he had, lots of money. It took me a long time to take that methodology and decide how I could teach it to people that had $4,000 accounts, $10,000 accounts. So I have, now that I have a partner, I have some time. I have the luxury of thinking and taking that and doing testing and, you know, getting somebody. We have somebody named Bradley. Thank you, Bradley, who does lots of work for us to build nice Excel spreadsheets so that we can do research and put this material um, into an acceptable format for people with smaller accounts. So Amos is contribution is don't trade unless the risk reward is three to one or better and of course always use stops and as you get larger and more complicated equivalent risk which we can talk about at another time uh, Tim I see you see you use instant software is this the software you recommend for doing your analysis um, Nick the, the reason I use Ensign is because so many of our members use Ensign and also it's really easy to draw on so, no, no reason other than that. Um, I use a different software with my brokers that I can literally pass to them when I go to sleep. When I get up in the morning, they pass it back to me. It's updated with, uh, you know, questions that they put on and observations. And we can pass it back and forth, but that's proprietary. But I still, I, I do most of my drawing off, off of Ensign or even, even just straight eSignal. Their charting software is fine. It's fine. Ken, I want to open an IB account with the best software. How soon will the software be ready per the upgrade you mentioned last month? 
that to Cynthia question. Well, I don't recall what we were talking about last month with the software, Tim, but we have just recently had a, an upgrade, and we are constantly upgrading our platform. Um, anyone, I'm not going to take away from Tim's presentation here, but you'll all get a copy of my email address, so if you have specific IB-related questions, um, simply send them to me, and I'll get back to you as quickly as possible. So let's get back to Tim and his questions. Thank and I you. do have a crush on Cynthia as well as Barbara Schmidt Bailey. The two of them <laughs> are the best people to work with to give to do education on the internet. Uh, we don't do anything together live. Um, Barbara and I used to, although I don't travel anymore. But um, Cynthia is like me. She she's a, she doesn't like to travel to things like Traders Expo. Um, so we do it on the internet, and uh, I think we have a darn good time. So I, I'll do it anytime she's willing to do it, so to speak. <laughs> What's my view on natural gas? It broke two yesterday. That's meaningless to me. My view, the last view I had on natural gas, and we did this live at marketgeometry.com, I'm in a uh, Twitter group with about 50 other hedge fund managers, and about 40 of them were tweeting back and forth, oh, my God, natural gas is just taking out the highs. This thing is going to explode. And everybody was all excited. And... I put. I just tweeted up a chart. I said, take a look and see what happened the last time it broke highs. Take a look and see what it did the time before that. And I got all kinds of, you know what, you're just, you know, you're a party pooper, you're this, you're that. Well, that was 5.6. Now we're at 2. I used to be an incredibly active intraday trader in natural gas. That was when it was below 1. And my guess is that most of you probably never traded natural gas when it was below 1. But I actually liked the market a whole lot better before it broke above one. It was much more interesting to trade. It was much more tradable. Um, I liked the uh, the way the market was set up. I, ha I have no particular opinion until we actually wake up and learn that we have, I mean, you may not know this, most of you. In the United States, we're the, we're more than, we have more natural gas than we could ever use, ever, if we actually started to use it. The problem is we don't use it. We're burning it off. We're just burning off. So until they actually start to use it, I I mean, there's money to be made there in small moves, but it's really not doing anything. There are other there are better things to trade. Um, let's see. Love to Mrs. Sean and uh Lucy, that's Mrs. Mrs. Sean is is Wendy, by the way. And Lucy's my daughter as well as, as Sean, my son. And they, both my daughter and my son trade real money. Um, thank you. Um, oh, oh, I see. How you doing? This is one of one of Dr. Andrews' students. Always glad to see you, my my friend. Uh, and I'm, by the way, I'm coming to Florida in June. I'll be I'll be there to see you. Um, let's see. How does your work different from the original Andrews material? What's the involvement of Babson in Andrews material? Roger Babson was walking around giving a presentation about Babson charts. And the Babs Babson charts are still sold today to corporations. They're not cheap if you want to, if you, if you want to subscribe. But for the first time in, oh my gosh, 50-some years, there's a Babson on the board of directors. He's now the, he's now the uh, I think he's the chairman. And um, the Babson family is very involved in Babson charts again. But Roger Babson was talking about at a time when W.D. Gann and some of the other people of the time were talking about very mystical Bible scientific things, tunnels through the air that you really couldn't do any mathematics about. Dr. Andrews was, of course, a physicist, as am I, by trade. And he was walking around. He was 24 years old. He was enjoying the free drinks, enjoying the pretty girls that were walking around as well. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, you hear somebody talking about moving averages, centered moving averages, um, calculus, and his, his ears perked up, and he couldn't help himself. Instead of the mumbo-jumbo that he heard every other week about, you know, um, like I said, tunnels through the air and all the other weird stuff, he heard somebody that was talking about pure mathematics, and that started a, a lifelong friendship. And he asked Dr. Ba uh, he said, no, excuse me, Roger Babson was not a doctor. He asked Roger Babson, could he take his work? They both went to MIT. 
could he go to MIT, get some graduate students, and along with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Andrews, who was the head of mathematics there, could he then take apart Roger Babson's work and see if it was valid? And Babson said, absolutely. I'd, I'd love you to go ahead and take a look at my work. And they came back after four long years of work. Because remember, there weren't computers back then. There weren't even calculators. There were slide rules. But basically, they had pencils and yellow pads. And I have a lot of that original work. And they came back and they said there's good news and bad news. The good news is we found some really great predictive tools. The bad news is it's not Babson charts. And they showed them what, he, what they found, which became action-reaction lines. Later on, it would become median lines. Babson, rather than being upset, once he digested the mathematics, was an instant con convert. And they became partners. And in 1929, when they were down the stock market floor, and when there's a famous day, of course, everybody knows who J.P. Morgan was. Of course, the bank's named for him. In 1907, he tried this trick. He came down to the floor and he said, I've got $10 million for anybody that wants to be long. And he's known for stopping the sell-off in 1907 on that day. That was the dead low. Well, Andrews and Babson were standing. They had made a lot of money in the crash already, so they were worth lots and lots of dough with a gentleman by the name of George Marichal. And J.P. Morgan, again, came down to the floor and said, I have $25 million for margin money for anybody that wants to buy stocks. And Babson looks at Andrew and said, I saw this in 1907. I've seen this trick before. It ain't going to work this time. Let's see if we can sell some. And they literally got thrown off the floor because, of course, unless you're a, an exchange member, with a jacket, you're not allowed to trade. They were jumping down trying to find a broker. They got thrown out. They had to find a phone. They had to get onto a broker and start selling. They sold everything they could to the close. And if you go back and do your homework, this you can find this out, by the way, f from a PBS special that did a wonderful job of going through it. The poor brokers were telling their families, telling their friends, J.P. Morgan's in buying. This is the dead bottom. He's known for doing this before. And one gentleman who said he was 17 at the time said it took him 30 years to pay off that debt. He, he borrowed every penny he could and put it on it. So what was the relationship with Babson? He became an instant convert to median lines and action-reaction lines. And they made a fortune. In the first crash, 1929 to 1930, Roger Babson made $55 million, which in today's money is a lot of dough. Andrews made $58 million, and for John F. Kennedy, I'm sorry, John Kennedy, Joseph Kennedy to you, senior, he made $455 million, which in today's money is over $14 billion. So that's the relationship. Then they made more in the crash in 1934, of course. Um, let's see. How do I keep hand drawing charts? Well, my biggest problem is hiding from my wife. Um, you know, she just, it's an hour out of my day. I follow 27 markets. I have a beautiful drafting board that Commodity Corporation had built for me. I get paper delivered quarterly that they prepaid for the rest of my life. Excuse me. And the reason I don't take a break is because it's so hard to catch up. And so when I, the next time I stop will be the end. But my wife literally paid the mover when I moved to Arizona three years ago to not bring my charts. And I, when I went through the truck and couldn't find the charts, I had to find the, the head of the moving company, and I had to bribe him more to put the charts back on the truck. So my, my wife would gladly have the extra hour out of the day, but it's the only way that I can keep hand drawing. I do not recommend anybody do it, but as we talked about myelination, you can look that up in the, in the uh, you can just Google it, or look it up in the dictionary if you want. It helps me when I draw by hand. It draws neural paths in my mind, and I recognize patterns that I've seen from before, before I even draw them on the chart. So for me, and I've been doing the, I've been hand drawing longer than I've been trading. I started hand drawing when I was nine years old because it was a good way to keep me out of the rain. I'll, I can tell that story another time if you wish, but I've been hand drawing since I was nine years old. So 
it's all ingrained in me, and I'll keep, like I said, when I'm done trading, I'll quit hand charting. But that works for me. I don't recommend it. It takes a lot of time. Could you show some trades that didn't work out and why? Maybe on the next webinar? Sure. You know what I'm going to do? Well, not the next one. The next one is going to be on options, and I'll, I'll have to tell you, I'm not the I'm not the deepest, although I used to run CRT, Chicago Research and Trading, which was the largest options firm in the world at that time. Um, my options knowledge is is pretty low relative to anybody that knows much about options, and I'm working with the, with the CME. Um, we're going to be looking at next month. We're going to be looking at short date options on the E mini S and P specifically. And so what we'll do is we'll use my analysis, and then we'll show how to use some very very simple option strategies that I might use to to capture that. But after that, so I don't. I'm not going to focus on losers. I'm going to focus on how you can combine options and these techniques. After that, the next month is going to be bonds, which I trade all the time, interest rate futures, and, may, and notes may be in there as well. And, uh, yeah, we'll put some losers in there as well. Sure, easy. When we show them all the time. We show our trades live at Market Geometry. We don't, like I said, at least a third of my trades are losses. Uh, my, and my partner, Shane, you learn, we both agree. You learn more from your losses than you do from your winners. Um, regarding energy points, is there a preference to which energy points are more likely to hold? For example, two median lines intersecting or an upper median line intersecting with a median line or basically any combination of median lines that intersect? Yeah, that's a great question, Brian. Here's the answer. How does that energy point relate to market structure? Are you near the bottom of congestion, for example, where whales may be buying? Are you near a swing high or a swing low where whale whales may be buying or selling? Um, are you at that scary drop that we talked about? When price bubbles up and then comes back down, if that energy point is right in that area, then it's important. If it's in the middle of nowhere, I'll mark it, but I really don't expect it to play out. So I think it's extremely important to look at market structure, then worry about the lines, then worry about the energy points after the lines. Um, what software do I use to replay the market? Could you draw your median lines while watching the market replay itself? Absolutely. I use both. I use you can do two th you can do three things. One, you can replay the market by just advancing it bar by bar and then go ahead and draw. And you can do that on almost any software. Um, Ensign has a nice replay function. I also use NeoTicker. Um, I know Lawrence, the owner, very well. And uh, and I have a custom uh, copy of NeoTicker, but you don't need a custom copy, and it, re it's, it replay is especially nice because my version, I can tell it, just pick some markets, don't tell me what they are, don't tell me the time frame, take off the symbol so I don't even know what I'm trading, and just run it at X speed for X amount, and I can practice for two or three hours on markets, I don't even know what I'm trading, it doesn't matter to me, and I can draw away and uh, just get my eye in tune, it's a good way to knock off the rust for me, and I do that at least two to four hours a week, which is a lot out of my schedule. Um, let's see. Um, any pointers for spotting the C point of a potential fork? The C point can be a challenge. Keith, the C point is the challenge, absolutely. And we just, uh, the last three sessions, at market geometry, we just we called it hunted, hunting the C point. We just went over it and over it and over it. And here's here's a clue for you to go back and take a look at, and it it has a lot to do with today. Find the chasers, and um, I don't think it'll be the bond one. I don't remember what we're doing after bonds, but we'll do one on washes and rinses. And washes and rinses are where we do we get you to bubble up, which we did today. We got you to chase the market and then wash you out of your position. What you like to see is you like to see price bubble up and wash and rinse everybody else out. And then when it starts to take out lows, that's a pretty good indication that that's a high probability upside C pivot. Same thing on the downside. If they wash and rinse people through, then you start to take out highs and you're looking for a C, that's a much higher probability than just simply making higher highs and higher lows. But if you, if you can get price to bust through but then come back and regain its momentum with the trend, 
that's that's a good place for a C. Um, let's see. Ah, Carlos gave us uh, the link to Shane's blog. Thank you, Carlos. And Carlos is our DVD producer. Um, what time frames do you use to recommend for day trading that are best for median line techniques? It doesn't matter. It depends on what on what works for you, Arturo. Um, I was showing five minutes because I know most of, uh, most people like five minutes in the E-mini S&Ps. In the currencies, they like 20 minutes. They like five minutes. I, personally, I like, this is a very odd one. I don't recommend you go do this unless you really want to get committed to it because you have to change a bunch of settings. But I like a day only, 13 minutes that start on the opening but close when the cash market closes which is 3 o'clock Chicago, 4 o'clock New York time, which is 390 minutes. And then I want it to be divisible. I want it to be equal bars, so that's why it's 13. 39 is too long for me. 13 is about right, but that's just me. But there'd be nothing wrong with trading 15 minutes to go all the way to the end or trading five minutes. Those are all fine. The w here's the way to think about it. If, it. if the chart looks pretty to you, and you can start to see the patterns of doing some work, you're in the right time frame, plus or minus a little bit. So everybody's a little different. And or you can go to things like tick charts. But that's a you know, that's a different animal, but a lot of people chase uh or trade off of tick mark trick ticks. I don't recommend range bars. They take away too much of the market structure. But I like tick tick based charts a lot. I like time based charts a lot. But there's no one thing. Anything, again, anything that fluctuates. Um, Mark says, in your book, Trading with Median Lines, you have a section about counting pivots and drawing a line from pivot zero to pivot four. We call that P0, P4, yep. What percentage of time do you think you get a change of behavior by a break of this line? All right. That counting method was not Dr. Andrews. It was Dr. Anderson, the head of mathematics at MIT. Excuse me. And um, he wanted a simple, easy way to have signposts along the way when charting. And nothing more than that. It's not like Elliott Wave where you, you got the C and then this has to be longer than this and it has to be this percentage of this. And if that doesn't happen, then we go back and we've got all these explanations. It's meant to be a very loose count. In fact, it's called the loose count. And my one, two, three, four, five can often be and often will be different than your one, two, three, four, five. However, you will usually find that the zero to four for most people is the same. Here's the key. They're just signposts. They're not meant to be anything more than that. So when price breaks through the zero to four line, it doesn't mean a new trend has begun. It's not a change in behavior. It only means that, let's say we're in a downtrend and we break above the P0 to P4 line. It just means that that downtrend is now over. Price can now congest and then stead, start head lower and then a new downtrend can continue. You don't know if the new trend is gonna be up or down. You just know that when P0 to P4 gets violated, that particular trend has ended, but it gives you no clue, and there are no statistics. If you do them, the statistics do not show you any inclination either way. Now, market structure study will give you a good handle on where it's likely to go, but P0, P4, um, it's relatively meaningless in terms of deciding where it, whether it's going to go up or down from there. Uh, let's see. Good kudos to Cynthia, always a good thing. Um, what is the title of the PBS special? It's um, it's on our Facebook page. It is, uh, Mary, if you're still there, it's the, it's the series about America. Um, I, I may think about it if I, if, if I can think about, if I can think of the name of it, um, I will, but the title's on there. We, we have it pegged. There it is, Arturo says. PBS.org, 
American experience. Thank you. It's American experience. Crash. It, it, this is a magnificent one. Let me just tell you. This is a mag. If you want to watch a, a, a wonderful description of what trading was like back then and what the crash was like, and they go into Joseph Kennedy and they talk about Andrews and Babson for about 10 or 15 minutes. It's a magnificent thing to watch. If you don't care, don't watch it. That's fine. But it's absolutely wonderful. Thank you for that, Arturo. The guy on the cover looks like Paul Tudor Jones. No comment. And, and Paul is a friend, but no comment. Um, let's see. Oh, and NC had that as well. Thank you, NC. Um, I think I may have missed your comment on different time frames or higher time frames to help determine overall trend. Brian, you, you would have missed that because I would never have made that comment. I believe, I know Dr. An Dr. Elder, I like him, he's a nice guy, but I think he's done a terrible disservice to the technical analysis community and especially to young traders. He's got people trading, or they have, they have to do analysis on three or four time frames, and the time frames have to match, otherwise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Look, here's the truth. And I, and I by the way, not only do I trade my own money for a living, but I trade for the largest sovereign wealth hedge funds in the world. I trade their money. Here's the truth. The time frame, you should do all your work on the time frame that you're trading. Forget about the larger time frames and the smaller time frames. The larger time frames have their own trends. They have their own support and resistance. The smaller time frames have completely different volatility as well as their own trends. And trying to mix and match does nothing for you other than to confuse you. You'll talk yourself out of trades. You'll talk yourself into trades. You'll be concerned about resistance in the 60-minute when you're trading the five-minute that has nothing to do with the five-minute. Think of it this way. If you're trading the five-minute and you're charting the 60-minute, which is going to turn first? The five-minute. So if you're trading the five-minute, trade the five-minute. Don't worry about it. If you're trading the 60-minute, don't worry about the five-minute because the five minutes is going to have lots of ups and downs that are contained in every 60-minute bar. You don't know about it, and you don't care. So pay attention to the chart and time frame that you normally trade. Forget about everything else. Get your trend from the time frame that you're, tra that you're charting, and you'll be all good. You won't be confused. More people get confused than that than any, almost anything I can think of. Uh, let's see. How long until the U.S. Default, <laughs> defaults on its debt? Median lines for clues. Well, in two months, Mark, if they haven't defaulted by then, um, we'll be doing bonds, and um, they've already come off significantly from their highs. But uh, um, my personal opinion is I, I just keep wondering why did the Fed give Greece and everybody else um, a chance to default on their debt, or at least mark their, down, their debt down to 30 cents on the dollar, um, why did they give them the edge? Why didn't we jump in? I mean, I, I have a uh, an article out there, and I'm going to put out a new one, um, but basically it says, here, you keep your crap and we'll keep our crap, which is basically, how about this? Europe, they can't pay their debts. We can't pay our debts. China can't pay its, our debts. Why doesn't everybody just say, you know what, let's just call it a day and start over and be honest about it? That's just me. Are they going to default? I don't know. Um, I think, Cynthia, unless I missed some, I think we're running low. Well, I think, and while I'll give everyone one last opportunity to put a question in, but I did want to jump in here, too, and because I noticed there were quite a few questions about adding pitchforks um, and those median lines to IB software. Now, I do want to mention anyone who is an IB client, underneath the About IB menu, there's actually a features poll, which is your direct line of communications to our development team. And Quite honestly, developers would rather hear from you than they would from me. So if you would like to see those median lines added to the software, um, simply make a suggestion through that poll. Um, they do monitor that and have been uh, <clears throat> and 
what I do see is that a lot of those suggestions do get implemented. So that's the quickest and fastest and most direct line to make that request. The um, other topic that I did want to mention as well, I know Tim was talking about Ensign software, and we do have quite a few partner programs, and those are available <clears throat> um, on the education menu. You'll find a marketplace at IB. So simply take a look at those partner programs with the software that we will work with your IB account. By the way, anyone, I just want to repeat again, you'll all be getting a direct link to today's recorded playback. And don't miss the uh, slides or the PDF of the slides that will pop up as you leave today's event. <clears throat> now, it will be uh, sent directly to you. It will also be archived on our website. But the nice thing there, if you do have questions about IB software, you'll also get my email address. So if you do have any questions specific to the IB platform, I don't want to take away from Tim's time today, but I'd be happy to answer them. So please send me an email and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. Okay, with that, did you see any additional questions pop see, in, I, Tim? I see one more, but let me just make a recommendation to everybody. If you ask Cynthia for help, she will help you, first of all, and nobody knows the platform better than Cynthia, and nobody teaches it better. So, you know, don't be shy. If you've got a question about IB software, ask her. If you wonder whether or not um, I like IB, my partner has his account there. Our, administer, our administrator has her account there. Uh, lots of people at Market Geometry have their account there. It's just that my, um, the people that I trade money for I have to go to the Bank of England, to be honest. So, you know, they tell me where to have the account. There's nothing I can do about it. But that being said, you know, in IB, I trust. You know, I'm not an IB employee. I don't get paid by IB. But as I said last month, you know, when Man Financial was going aloha, if you want to go someplace that understands and follows a very conservative route to things like segregated accounts, I think interactive brokers is about as good as it gets. That's but that's just my opinion. I have no, I have no relationship to them other than I like Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia, I can't even man, I I can't even name the president. So, you know, I think that's a good thing. Don't you? <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Tim. Yes, feeling is now now everyone knows why I enjoy having Tim come on to these events as well. So, thank you so much. Now, I do see there's. Uh, were you going to answer Roman's Go question? Roman, yeah, I'll grab Roman. Yeah, okay, and then we'll end it. <laughs> we're, we're done with the love part. I know, but it it certainly is fun to have you, Tim. Uh, excellent information, and I just want to thank you for everyone who has attended. Um, we certainly appreciate the time you spend with us each month, yes, so thank you. Please, please make sure you grab the PDFs and then go back and look at them, because um, on the second and third round through, you'll just grab so much more. Anyway, Roman asks, what do you recommend for stop locations? Do you make use of average true range? Well, kind of, sort of. What considerations do you take into account? Here's what I take into consideration. Again, Roman, I want to know where are the buyers. If it's not me, and I can name in any in any given market who the other whales are. You know, for example, in one of the currencies that I love to trade, it's a gentleman that I used to trade for me. His name is Jamie. He gets lots of do me under management. I want to know where Jamie's playing. Where's Jamie's orders? And believe me, Jamie's saying, where's Tim's orders? So I look at a chart, and I identify where's the likely place for these orders to be hanging out. Also, if, they're, if it's an easy place to identify, where are the 5 trillion retail orders that are trying to buy? Where are they hanging out? I identify those first. Average true range, I'll take a look at average true range. That will help me understand how much noise is in the market, and that tells me, how far do I have to hide underneath, underneath, if I'm buying, or above, if I'm selling, that area? We call that noise, simply noise. So um, we actually just did a seminar called, you know, treating your trading like a professional. And uh, Shane's portion was about how to identify the noise so that when the market pulls back against the trend, you survive 85% of the time. And the way to do that is to look at the average true range and figure out what the noise is, and then be above those structures, that amount of noise. So th that's how I do it. That's, that's not an ABC thing, Robin, but you'll have to do some of the homework, but it gives you an idea of exactly how I do it. So I think that uh, takes care of it. And 
you're welcome. Um, if you have questions, you can send them to Cynthia and she'll forward them to me. You can certainly send them to me um, at timothymorge at marketgeometry.com. Very simple. Um, a, a, a big thank you to my partner, Shane, for all the work. Um, he's recording for me as well today, uh, but, but certainly all the work. And uh, we'll be putting, Cynthia, I swear, we'll be well ahead of the uh, deadline. I'm not going to be working at 1 o'clock in the morning next month. But um, next month is going to be options. And to tell you all in advance, it will be options on the E-mini S&Ps. Okay? But I can do this to you as well, my friend. So... Okay. Now, one more item, because I see everyone, and you've mentioned your slides as well. I do want you to know, not only if you, uh, well, if you do happen to miss them as you exit today's session, they're also posted on our website side by side with direct links to each of Tim's re, uh, playbacks. So all of the recordings you can find underneath the education menu. There's a webinars link. And simply drill down into the recorded sessions and the industry-sponsored events. You'll find that there are filters up at the top of the page that will allow you to locate Tim Morge and then the complete list of all of his webinars will appear with links to the recordings as well as links to the webinar notes. So and if you look um, really if you look if you look a little bit you can actually find in the educational area how to vote and say hey Tim Morge did a good job which moves me up the list. I'm number two but it's always nice to get higher on the list because it allows Cynthia to say, hey you know I'd like Tim to do an extra whatever and of course, if our ratings are going up, it makes it easier for us to sell that idea. And actually, I'm glad you mentioned that, Tim, because that's located in the same place where you can find the um, uh, software tools. We also have educators. So it's underneath the education menu. You'll find the marketplace at IB and can drill down into the educators. And notice that Tim just recently added has moved up to second. And so uh, we do encourage you to vote uh, for your favorite educators there as well. IB seems to like that voting um, capability. So please do uh, send us your comments. But yeah, it looks if like. If you get lost. And you can't figure out where the IB, where, where the ones that I did for IB are at. If you just go to Market Geometry under Free Information, they're all listed. It says right there, IB Seminars, and I think this will be the ninth or tenth one that we have listed. So. I don't think you can vote if you're not an IB client. No. That's right. No, you can't. But you still do get access to the recordings and to the webinar notes, Keith. So, um, but the voting is uh, you do have to have an IB account for that. <clears throat> um, Okay, but anyway, that looks like we are going to wrap up today. So um, we're going to complete for April, but keep in mind, coming up in May, um, and you may want to mark your calendars on May 10th, we'll be meeting up with uh, Tim one more time. So be on the lookout for that. We'll be posting the um, webinar links uh, in the upcoming weeks. So thank you all for your participation here with us today. We certainly do appreciate it. And especially a great deal of thanks to Tim Morge and to the CME group for making today's presentation possible. So thank you all, everyone. Um, remember, as you exit, today's slides will appear as a, a pop-up um, <clears throat> browser window. So you can access them from there and watch your email later on this afternoon for a direct link to today's recorded playback. So you can come back and listen to Tim as often as you'd like and whenever it's convenient for you. So thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. And especially, thank you so much, Tim Morris. Uh, looking forward to your next talk. Have a great thanks, day, everyone. Thanks, Cynthia. I thank all of you for taking time. And have a wonderful Thursday. The week's almost over. Cheer up. And uh, we'll see you in a month. Thank you, Tim. Take care.